Um, it is uh, incredibly fun to be able to do this, although I can remember, you know, even though I'm pretty old, um, doing this in person, and it's more fun in person. Um, get to pick on John Pudner, um, get to celebrate and sing and do all the things you get to do in person. But here we are in the middle of a freaking pandemic. And so this is the way we have to make democracy work. And I want to talk tonight about how we are going to make democracy work and what we have to do to get to that place. Um, but it's pretty obvious that we're in a scary place right now. It's as if we're standing at an abyss, you know, kind of our feet at the edge. The ground is beginning to crumble beneath us a bit. And we look down and it's just flat out terrifying. We're in a moment when the president is openly on television, essentially promising a coup uh, if the election results don't go the way he says they should go. He talks about throwing out the ballots at a moment when people are struggling to understand how they're going to have even the chance to cast their ballots in the middle of this pandemic. And yet his polls are going up in this moment, not down. America is responding in a certain way and not the way we, I would have expected. And it's not just him. We're in the middle of a pandemic. But what's astonishing about this pandemic is that the pandemic has been itself polarized. Pew has done studies about attitudes about the pandemic. And the thing that explains what people think is not their age, not their intelligence, not their income, not their sex, their political party. So a majority in June, Pew reported, a majority of Republicans think the worst is behind us, that's radically different from what Democrats believe. Pew also reported that 30%, uh, 29% uh, of Republicans report that they always wear masks when going out in public. Twice as many Democrats do that. This difference is a difference of politics about a matter that in some sense has nothing to do with politics. And it's not like an issue like climate change that is 30 years in the future, where we can't imagine really how it's affecting us. All of us are living in a time where we see how it's affecting us. And I'm sure everyone in this audience knows someone who has been directly affected by the consequences of this disease. But the truth is every abyss story is really the same story. Every abyss story is about the trick and the trick for facing an abyss is always to look beyond to the other side, to keep focus on that other side, to keep focus on what is possible and to ignore the certain death if we fail. <clears throat> so that's me, that's my job here. I wanna focus you on what's possible if we're smart and what to fear because after all, it is a fucking abyss. Okay, so <clears throat> number one, what's possible? It is astonishing, at least for those of us who've been in this fight now for more than a dozen years, how far we've come. I was persuaded to get into this fight in 2007 by a friend, Aaron Swartz, who came to me as I was finishing the last book that I would write about copyright and said to me, all of this has been a waste, that I shouldn't be focused on these issues that cannot be solved given the deep corruption of our political system. I needed instead to be focused on that corruption. And that night in Berlin, I promised Aaron I would give up my work about internet and copyright issues and I would take up this fight for corruption. And since that time, I've done what academics done. I've written book after book, but I've given hundreds of speeches and I've marched all across the country, including with groups in Washington, groups in New Hampshire, groups in California to raise attention to this issue. Now, the striking thing is when I began in this fight, almost no one got it. I was once at a talk in Washington, D.C., something called the Lib Liberal Dinner, where libertarians and uh, liberals got together for dinner. There are a lot of policy wonks, 
from Capitol Hill, and they would talk about issues that were of common interest. And one guy at that meeting said, you know, I thought science, political science, as if that science, had proven that money didn't matter in politics. And then shortly after that meeting, a friend who was so exhausted by my attention to this issue, so impatient that I would think this is something we ought to fight about, said, look, people don't give a shit about process. They care only about substance, whether there is a higher social security payment or a higher minimum wage. But what I saw as I went across the country speaking everywhere was that people did care about process. And what I've noticed is this slow growth in recognition because of the work of thousands of people, including many of you in this audience who have been fighting to make this issue central for the last decade at least. And we can see something in the difference in just comparing 2016 to 2020. In 2016, on this issue, there was basically silence in the Democratic Party about this critical issue of corruption. Indeed, the only time we saw it explode on a national debate stage was when Donald Trump called out every other Republican uh, uh, candidate for being owned by him and attacked super PACs as a corruption. There was, in the Democratic Party, though, a, a weird reluctance to address and to take on this issue. The issue was buried in policy papers, but it was not the issue that they wanted to put first. It was resisted by the party as an issue. But then the striking fact about that year is how different it was from this year. This year, the fight has been totally different. And that's because 2020 happened after 2019, which happened after 2018, because in 2018, this woman made an extraordinarily important promise. Nancy Pelosi said, if the Democrats win control of the House, she promised to pass the most ambitious democracy reform package passed by the House since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And when the Democrats took control of the House, Nancy Pelosi delivered on her promise. H.R. 1 was extraordinarily ambitious in the reforms that it promised, public funding for congressional campaigns, an end to gerrymandering of federal offices, an equal freedom to vote by restoring of the Voting Rights Act and protecting people's ability to participate through automatic vote registration, and many other reforms. H.R. 1 was an inspiration because it brought together these different kinds of reforms and said, we need to fix all of them. And by calling it HR1, what she was saying is we had to fix it first. Now, what's striking about the 2020 primary season was that HR1 became the floor. The question was, wasn't whether you were for HR1. The question was, what were you for in addition to HR1? And working with groups like Represent Us and Citizens United and my group, Equal Citizens, we were able to get every single major Democratic candidate, as well as Bill Weld on the Republican side, to agree that they would fix democracy first, that we would see something like HR1 or HR1 Plus passed within the first 100 days of the 2021 administration. Now, that is just unbelievable compared to 2016 but it became a reality in 2020. And it signals we've entered this new age where there are democracy reformers everywhere, which I kind of don't like because that means there are more competitors to my books, which, you know, of course, are the only thing anybody needs to read. But there's plenty out there now talking about the kinds of changes that we need. So the Berggruen Institute has an extraordinarily comprehensive package of the 5 billion different changes that have to happen to our democracy. So too with the American Academy, endless proposals for changing to make our democracy actually responsive. Even Vox had to put together a list. And of course, 10 is not a number Vox would ever use. So it's 11 ways to fix a broken democracy, endless descriptions of all the changes that have to happen. Okay, so here's though the problem with these approaches. These are all kind of kitchen sink reform proposals. They are long lists of everything that must change. 
They're kind of how rich people renovate, gut renovate houses. They come in, they tear everything out, and then they just imagine, they dream of all the billion things that their billions of dollars will allow them to put into that house. And when I hear these lists, I think to myself, you know, kind of in a <clears throat> Hamilton way, it must be nice. It must be nice to be able to it afford all nice. that. But the point is, it's not just about affording it. It's not just that it's wrong. I think it's self-defeating because the point is old houses don't defend their flaws. Old houses don't resist reform. They don't rally all the money in the world to protect themselves against change. They give in to the builders and the architects and the construction crew. But DC will resist this change. DC will fight back. And our strategy must be to take them out first. And that means to take the money out first. Because only if we push money off the stage will any of these other reforms ever have a chance. Now, the strategy then must be this. We must fix democracy first, but to do that, we must fix the money problem first. And not in a small way, but in a big way. So for example, HR1 has, as I've said, at its core, public funding for congressional elections. And the proposal actually has two different ideas put together. There's a matching fund proposal, and there's a pilot for a voucher proposal. So the matching fund proposal enables people to get up to a six to one match, depending on whether they limit themselves to small contributions. And that's a strategy that's been used by places like New York City to make it easier for people to raise money for campaigns in smaller contributions, because those small contributions turn out to be worth a lot of money. And the second part of HR1 was a voucher pilot. A voucher pilot following the great example of Seattle, which gives vouchers to every citizen that they can use to help fund the campaigns for city offices. This pilot says that three states in the nation will be selected and that citizens can get a $25 voucher if they ask. And with that pilot, the plan is to evaluate how significant this reform package could be. Okay, now my view is this is great, but it's also my view that this is not enough. It is not enough if we're going to change an economy of influence that turns on money. The six times matching from people who can afford to give money to political campaigns, which many people think is described as rich people, is not going to be enough. And instead, what we need to do is to follow the lead of some of the most extraordinary candidates in that Democratic primary who began to push the Democratic Party to ask for something more than just matching funds. Andrew Yang was first coming out of the, back, uh, the box in April of uh, 2019, calling for a $100 voucher for every voter. Kirsten Gillibrand then upped that by saying $200 per race, which means that if you are living in a district that has a House race, a Senate race, and the presidency at the same time, you get up to $600 in vouchers. And Bernie Sanders, at the end of the primary season, came out firmly for the idea of vouchers. And in a Democratic town hall, in a town hall in, in uh, New Hampshire, he gave the most persuasive account of why we need vouchers and why vouchers are more transformative than the matching fund proposal. Now, I think these candidates are right. And what their rightness means is that what we need in this reform proposal is a massive test, at least, of vouchers. I think we need to say 200 congressional districts across the country, 100 Republican and 100 Democrat. In those districts, every single voter will have a voucher sent to them, not a voucher that they can fill out a form and get online, so that they have the money, the vouchers in their hands, and that the business model of fundraising in those 200 districts for the campaigns that are trying to compete changes radically. 
because no longer do those candidates to spend 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money from the tiniest fraction of the one percent but candidates can as has been demonstrated in seattle turn to ordinary people to raise the money they need to make themselves competitive in this race. We need this test so that we can sure show clearly what it would mean to have a democracy, the kind that Madison described, where we would have a branch of government that would be dependent on the people alone. And by the people, Madison was not talking about corporations. And by the people, Madison said expressly, he was talking about not the rich more than the poor. What Madison wanted was a system where representatives thought about everybody because everybody controlled whether they got back to office. And in the modern age, what that means is they need to depend on everybody, both to fund campaigns and to get election, elected. Because here's the important point that is the reason for my title in this talk. This is how they're going to kill reform. This is how they're going to kill public funding in reform. This guy, a friend of mine, a brilliant journalist, scholar, leader of Vox, Ezra Klein, maps out the argument for why they're going to try to kill reform, why they're going to try to kill public funding. In his really extraordinary book, which I recommend strongly. I mean, you should get two copies of mine, but at least one of Ezra's book. Ezra says that small dollar donors polarize us, that depending on small dollar donors turns the politicians into even more polarized politicians than they otherwise would be, because the sort of people who give money, like the sort of people who show up in a primary, tend to be the most politically engaged, and they tend to be the most extreme within their party. And so a system of matching funds, Ezra Klein believes, is a system that would make politics even more polarized. And when you have an argument like that out there, the powers that be will grab it and they will exploit it. And they will say, yes, it's a serious problem we have, the corrupting influence of money. But we don't want to even more extremely polarize Congress or the people. So maybe we shouldn't try this idea of public funding. Now, I don't believe this fact, this claim by Ezra Klein is true. But the point is, it's an argument against us. And if it is true, I think it's true with matching fund systems. I don't think it's true with vouchers. Because with matching fund systems, you need people to give their own money. And it is true. The people who give money are the people most engaged. And those tend to be at the extremes. But with vouchers, there would be an extraordinary amount of money sitting in the middle that would be attracted by candidates who were pleading to those people to just take the simple step of showing up to a, a rally or a picnic with their vouchers so that you can fund the campaigns through their contributions. There's a real chance, I think, that a real experiment would demonstrate that vouchers don't polarize America. Instead, vouchers produce the America that Madison promised us we would have. So. We have to resist the resistance. And to resist this resistance to this fundamental reform, we need vouchers too. Or my view is we need vouchers mainly. We need vouchers, if not exclusively, at least a central part of the plan. And so we must demand that now, or maybe when it's in the moment when it's possible to demand, to demand it, we need to be pushing for it strongly. Because this reform, is a reform that appeals across the political divide, as my friend John Pudner will tell you. It's a reform that Republicans can get behind if ever they can get beyond the ridiculous rhetoric of welfare for politicians. Because after all, embrace your inner tea party here. Whose money is it? When we send money to the government in forms of taxes and the government gives it back to us, whose money is it? It's our money. 
And it's given back to us, as Richard Painter, one of the founders of Take Back Our Republic says, so that we can have representatives who represent us. And that is the strategy we need to be pushing before the anti-reformers turn fear, the fear of polarization against reform. Okay, so the point here is this, we are close. <laughs> we are closer than we have ever been, ever been to fundamental reform of this corrupted political system. And if, and I realize this is a big if, if we can get Moscow Mitch and Moscow's bitch into a plane and send them back to where they belong, which of course is Moscow, if we can make that happen so that there's a chance that we can pass the House and the Senate and have a president who signs this bill, then there is a real chance, a real chance for real change. And if those who are font aficionados, you'll notice that's actually the Obama font. I just stole it to put it up here to emphasize the potential, and then I'm going to pick on the president a bit about the potential for real change. Okay, that's what's possible. But here's what's also possible. <laughs> Let's go back to that abyss for a minute. Let's stare over that cliff. And let's recognize what is a terrifying reality. The American democracy is incredibly fragile. The democracy that operates to select the president is incredibly fragile. The system presumes that there will be good faith on all sides. And I don't believe the president has demonstrated a willingness to practice that good faith. We've seen it historically. Richard Nixon in 1960 could easily have fought the corruption in Chicago that led to John Kennedy winning the state of Illinois. He chose not to do that because he chose to put country over himself. And Al Gore in 2000, after the Supreme Court astonishingly stopped the counting of votes forcing the results that Florida would go for George Bush. Al Gore chose not to contest the result, not because there wasn't a path forward, there clearly was, but because he put country over party. But the signals coming out of this administration are that they are going to do whatever they can to hold power, because there's a view among many of them that if they lose it, they are toast. So what can they do? So here's the fact which I've spent the last four years studying because I've spent the last four years preparing for an oral argument in the Supreme Court about the Electoral College. And what that four years of studying has convinced me of is that the system for selecting our president is extraordinarily broken and that it is so easy to hack that system if you have someone willing to try. Because what will happen as this election unfolds is that the moves that are possible are whatever moves are, quote, plausible. By which I mean moves that other people have made, other people have signaled, other people have said is a possible interpretation of the Constitution. And because it's out there now, they can rely on it as a plausible interpretation of the Constitution or of the Electoral Count Act. So what's plausible? Well, it's a plausible view that the state legislature can just cancel the elections and appoint their electors directly. It's a plausible view that after the election, they can just say, oh, the election was bad, it was broken, so we're gonna appoint the election electors directly. It's a plausible view that states can generate multiple slates one slate for one side, the other slate for another. And Mike Pence, as the president of the Senate, has the power to pick which will be counted. It's a plausible view that they can generate multiple slates. And then if it looks like the Democrats will take over the House and Senate, they claim that the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional and they move the, the moment when the electors are counted to before the new Congress kicks in. Now, all of these plausible views, I think, are wrong. But the question isn't whether they're wrong. The question is, who is going to say that they are wrong? 
Who is going to stop the deployment of these arguments and the force which that deployment could affect? Now, in the face of that, I think our response to these plausible moves has got to begin now. And it begins first with discipline. We have to know how they play us. And we have to respond to that knowledge. The most terrifying interview I ever read from this terrifying man, Steve Bannon, published in The Atlantic, included this passage. Bannon said, the Democrats, he said, the longer they talk about identity politics, I got them. I want them to talk about racism every day. If the left is focused on race and identity and we go with economic nationalism, we can crush the Democrats. And what that point led me to believe, to recognize, is kind of obvious, it's kind of obvious that it's stupid that we wouldn't see it before, is that so much of this is not a belief or not just a belief. So much of the race baiting wasn't just a belief. It was a strategy. It was a strategy. And given what America is, and I urgently press you to look at works like The, Di the Dying of Whiteness and uh, Cast. Maybe that's Dying by Whiteness. I might have grabbed the wrong book cover. I'm sorry if I did, but it's the extraordinary story of policies which are driven uh, for the right, um, but actually um, uh, hurt uh, those that they are intended to benefit. But these policies, given America, this is a strategy that works. And we must discipline ourselves in light of that fact so as not to be played by them. Or for example, think about the protests that we've seen triggered by the death, the murder of George Floyd. Time reported recently a study which was um, uh, covered by many that showed that 93% of those protests have been peaceful. But it's clear that the plan on the other side is to turn them violent, because the violence triggers a reaction in ordinary Americans to resist those who are protesting. So we need a discipline to resist, to resist being played. OK, now, the fact is I'm actually skeptical about whether we can exercise the discipline to stay on our strategy, because discipline is not our strength. What is our strength is the second thing we need here, and that's sacrifice. Now, I don't know how the election will come out. And if Donald Trump wins fairly, then Donald Trump should be our president, and we need to work hard for those of us who don't believe in his policies to convince America against his policies. And if Donald Trump prevails in a normal way, then I think it's on all of us, especially those who are critical of him, to stand up and say, the man has been reelected by America, and the work now is a work to convince America. But the fear many people have is that the strategy is being discussed openly by the campaign on the other side are strategies that will strike most Americans as efforts to steal this election. That's the abyss. And if they steal this, we must be ready. We must be ready to fight. And we must be ready to sacrifice. And you could say, well, sacrifice means giving money or par protests or participating in marches. And I don't mean that. I mean, we need to start thinking about how much we are willing to sacrifice. And we need to talk about sacrificing everything here to make as much of a sacrifice as necessary to make sure it is a peaceful and fair election. There's an extraordinary site that's been launched by George Lakey, Choose Democracy, choosedemocracy.us. And you can go on that site and you can make this pledge. We will vote. We will refuse to accept election results until all the votes are counted. We will nonviolently take to the streets if a coup, a coup, this is America, that's the word, a coup is attempted. And if we need to, we will shut down this country to protect the integrity of this democratic process. That's great. I think it needs a fifth pledge. If we need to, we will make whatever sacrifice saving this democracy requires. That is, whatever it requires.
And we must be willing here to signal our willingness to sacrifice everything in light, in honor of those who've sacrificed everything in some sense for a more abstract ideal. We went to Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and part of our mission was to make those countries safe for democracy, however misguided that mission was. And hundreds of thousands of people, not quite as many as die, who have died from COVID, but almost died, gave the ultimate sacrifice for those fights for democracy. We need to make the world recognize that we recognize we need that same sacrifice here if they steal this. We need maybe not an army, maybe a wolf pack to make it possible to make them see that that theft will not stand. Everyone must see, as Dylan Thomas would put it, we will not go gentle into that good night, or maybe a more popular version, President Whitmore. We will not go quietly into the night. No, we will not go quietly, because for this, for this democracy, for these ideals, for that which we have fought for for so long, we will give everything. OK, just one more thought. In April of 2008, Barack Obama gave a speech to the AFL-CIO in which he told them they needed to, quote, take up the fight. He said, if you're not willing to take up that fight, and he was talking about the fight to change the way Washington works, he said, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Take up that fight. Now, my view is Barack Obama was a great president, but the reality is the reality we all must be willing to acknowledge is he never took up that fight. Indeed, after he beat Hillary Clinton in the primary in 2008, he stopped talking about the need to take up that fight. He shifted his focus. He thought he could achieve all the things he wanted to achieve just by being the great Barack Obama that he would walk in and get climate change legislation and healthcare legislation and a change to the uh, minimum wage and everything else that he was talking about simply by persuading people and money would run away. That was extraordinarily naive because if he had listened to him, his own speech, he would have recognized that if we don't take up that fight, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. He was right a dozen years ago. His words are right today. We must today take up that fight. And we will take up that fight if we can cross this abyss. I'm so happy to have a chance to talk to you, people who've made things happen, because you need to help to make that happen here, too. Thank you very much.